Hello, I'm Doug Musio. This is a special edition of City Talk and the second of our series, New York Elects. Some of these conversations were air on City Talk, some on Eldridge and Company. Our website, CUNY.TV, will list guests and dates. This time, my colleague Ronnie Eldridge, the host of Eldridge and Company, and I are joined by the Republican gubernatorial candidate, John Faso. Three recent headlines capture the Republican race for governor. On May 17th, the New York Times headlined, Challenge to Weldon Governor's Race Stirs a Battle for the Republican Soul. The next day, the Times headlined, GOP Hopes to Block Candidate as Extreme. And on May 22nd, the Sun headlined, Weld is Set to Receive Pataki Nod. Who is this Weld challenger? He who shall not be named? Is he that extreme? Why isn't he being endorsed by Governor Pataki? He's John Faso, former Assembly Minority Leader and Republican candidate for controller in 2002, narrowly losing to Alan Hevesy, and most recently, a practicing attorney and lobbyist. Welcome, John. Thank you. Great to be here <laughs> with both of you. It's Our pleasure. <laughs> How do you feel about being called variously bizarre and extremist? Why are they saying these nasty things about you, even when they mention your name? We'll get into that later. Well, you know, uh, I'm a parent of, uh, of two kids, and uh, one is still a teenager, so I've been called a lot of names uh, in the, on that score. But really, I think these, this is the, um, an instance where a campaign is getting a little desperate, getting worried. Uh, they only attack you if they think you're ahead, and uh, we're doing very well. My message has been consistent for 20 years in both in and out of public life that New York spends, borrows, and taxes more than its citizens can afford and that especially in light of the global economy we're dealing with and the competitive pressures we've got to change some of the things we're doing. But underlying the way the party is presenting you, the party, the GOP, I mean if they get it in there it's the party establishment, right? What, I mean is this an ideological fight or is it a, a, a question of the power within the party and how it's used. You know, it's it's really. I don't think it's either one of those. Yeah. I think it's just that they have their the leadership. Guy. I the leaders. Some of the leaders have their guy, and they're trying to smear, distort, tar me. Uh, well, what, with did labels. they have discussions with you about a possible run since you did so well when you ran as controller before they decided they wanted Weld? Well, uh, no. The answer yeah. is no. I mean, I I've looked at this. I think that the agenda that I'm offering, whether it's on school property tax reform, whether it's on charter schools and education reform, I was the original sponsor in the state legislature of charter schools. I believe strongly in in reforms which give parents more choices, particularly poor and middle income parents. I also think that New York can't continue to uh, rely on debt to fund all of its infra infrastructure needs. New York has systematically reduced, for instance, the amount available for roads and bridges and for mass transit uh, on a pay-as-you-go basis. So I have a specific program that would take $600 million plus dollars of sales taxes on gasoline and diesel and put that money on a pay-as-you-go basis into road and bridge and transportation projects that we desperately need, not just here in the metropolitan area, but across the state. So these are uh, considered serious and principled positions that I've had for 20 years in, in and out of politics. So these kind of name, name calling, well, I don't I think Well, I think works. the name calling is ridiculous, but it's interesting. I mean, the party systems, I think, in both parties are non-existent anymore, I think. Now, yeah, let's talk way. about that. Let's and talk I about... I know you want to talk about your platform yes. and what you want to do, but uh, and, and we're we, gonna, want we want to talk a little about bit about underlying We'll talk politics. about politics and then policy. What is this Republican soul? Is the, does the Republican I, Party have a soul? I, I, I can't get into the mind of the headline writer. Right. What, I'm, what I does have Pataki find, have a soul? Have we, have we for the last I'm 12 also, years, I'm had a, a Pataki I, soul? I, I don't know. I'm also not in the business of determining uh, you know, those kind of questions. Theological questions. questions. <laughs> no, definitely not. <laughs> the, but the, the, the point is that I've been making, as I speak across the state, yeah 
to Republican and conservative and other audiences is that the tax borrow spend mentality. New York this year in its budget is going to spend eight or nine percent more than it did last year. Now, how many of your viewers mm -hmm. watching this program have their salaries go up nine percent right. over last year? Uh, we've got we rank number one in the people number of people leaving our state. The out migration from New York is number one in the nation. Census Bureau reported it just three weeks ago. And we rank number 50 in the business tax climate. And those two things are related. We are driving jobs and opportunity away. If you took upstate New York, everything north of Orange County, and looked at it as though it was a separate state, it would have the slowest rate of population growth of any state in the nation, with the exception of North Dakota and West Virginia. Well, okay, it? now, you, you, I'm no, sorry. Go on. You've talked a lot about policy, and your website is full of policy. I mean, it's very substantive stuff. What are the two items at the very top of your governing agenda? What will characterize, for example, the first 100 days of a FASO administration? What are you going to target in on, given the wide variety of things that you talk about? What's central here? Cut property taxes and um, instill spending discipline so that we're not um, engaging in a lot of reckless backdoor borrowing and we're putting again more cash resources into the infrastructure needs that we need throughout the How do you state. Address, I'm sorry, no, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, aren't people, we don't have the growth above Orange County because we don't have the job potential up there? It's, it's Is that related? Well, it's, it's, it's related. I mean, business looks at where do they locate? And they look at all sorts of things. Energy costs in New York are one or two in highest in the nation. Uh, workers' compensation are the 72 percent above the national average. Liability costs, property costs, state and local taxes are 72 percent above the national average. What do you so, do with it? I'm so, sorry. So all of these things, y y it's not just one thing. It's right. the totality of all but of these it, things. I mean, I get the impression that New York State is an older state. <laughs> of course, I mean, we've got the city and uh, people like me have always lived here, so I don't have the same understanding, but it's an older state. Right. We're not part of the agribusiness, this, this internationalization of agriculture, are we? I mean, our dairy farmers and all the, the small farmers, you go up to, uh, what's Delhi? What county is that? Delaware. Where, Delaware where, County. Me, my mother-in-law lives in De Delhi. I love Delhi. Delhi. Uh, Del I well, love it. Wait a minute. But now, Delaware County has all these right. form of farms that well, are ag now. Agriculture, the, Ronnie, actually, agriculture is still actually a big the, thing. The, the, one of the largest industries in is New York growing? State. Is it growing? It's not growing, right. uh, but it, it, again, agriculture is adversely affected by high real estate property taxes, right. which are just devastating. In New York, uh, whether it's education costs, and I've got specific proposals on how to rein in the growth in education costs and direct more money to the classroom, um, whether it's Medicaid reform, where New York is alone among the major states requiring a portion of the Medicaid burden in this state to be paid by New York City taxpayers and by county property taxpayers outside of New York City. So there, there are a lot of things. New York always had this kind of smugness, arrogance about it, collectively. I'm talking about for 50 years that we could borrow more, spend more, tax more because we were New York. Well, people don't have to be here if they're in a, the financial businesses. They can be in Charlotte, North Carolina. They don't have to be in New York if they're in uh, a Wall Street or insurance business. They can just as easily be in Connecticut or other, some other business center around. A different around, country, yeah. Uh, or a different country. Right now, uh, New York State, central New York outside of Syracuse, is in competition with um, North Carolina for the location of a $1 billion Bristol Myers manufacturing plant. That would be a spectacular plant for central New York, thousands of well paying jobs. The biggest disadvantage for New York is our high property tax, high energy costs, and workers' compensation. And, you know, this is the kind of thing that, you know, your viewers on this program may not be accustomed to hearing a, 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 a candidate talk about workers' compensation and the nitty-gritty. One of the things I bring to this race that none of the other candidates, Democrat or Republican, certainly not Mr. Spitzer, um, or Mr. Swazi, and certainly not Mr. Weld, whose experience is, is in Massachusetts, and it's, you know, 10 years old. My experience is, for 20 years, has been delving into the, the, all the nuance and the intricacies of New York's issues. Why, when you say you want to, mm. I'm sorry, yeah. not, when you say you, you want to change the workman's compensation and, <clears throat> and limit the payments, I think, to 550 
50 months, is that what you said? 500 weeks. 500 weeks, I meant weeks. Yeah, right now we what have... What happens after that? Well, what, what you have... Explain that whole process. There's, there's, there's a category called permanent partial disability. Right. That represents 14% of the claims for workers' comp, right. but it's about 70% of the premiums that employers pay because it's open-ended. And, and for over 40 states have limitations on permanent partial disability based upon the severity of the in injury, which is an analyzed based upon objective medical standards that are commonly well, used by the... what happens to the person who's so, who's so badly injured that he well, then, can't work then and that person 10 years of the workman's comp, that right? person then ultimately they go on to permanent, permanent, dis permanent disability, correct. But because of the unlimited nature of the current permanent partial disability, mm -hmm. there's no real incentive ultimately to get off. And the, we actually in New York State have a system whereby people are collecting pensions and still and getting still. workers' comp. So no one ever intended workers' comp to be paid while you're collecting a pension. So there are, these are the kind of things. Uh, contractor liability. We have something called uh, strict liability for contractors. The rebuilding of, of the World Trade Center and all of the housing projects that, that we know we need here in, in the New York City metropolitan area, those costs are, are escalated by enormous amounts in the tens of millions of dollars because of strict liability, not by WICs, but by, by, the liability? By, by the liability costs that only New York imposes on contractors that build it. Because if someone is injured at a work site under New York law, they are automatically liable, both the, the operator, the, the employer, and the owner of the property. You can't even put in a defense. So if the employee went up and violated the rules in terms of safety procedures or came back from lunch and was drunk or otherwise uh, uh, inebriated, the fact is if he falls, the employer is still liable under New York law. But that doesn't seem to inhibit the development. Well, actually, it, what it Not does... Not in New York. I don't what, know it, about. what it does is it makes it much more expensive. And the cost of housing is really a problem in this state and in the metropolitan area. The, just this one law adds to the cost of a single family house anywhere between five and ten thousand dollars per house. Uh -huh. So those kind of things, what I describe as the collective straws on the camel's back of the economy that have been steadily layered in, right. those are the things when people say, well why are our taxes so high? Why does it cost so much to live here? Those are things that you have to address. Let's move away from straw to logs on the camel's back. Talk to me about your... I didn't, I didn't grow up in a log cabin, though. I no, what does that mean? <laughs> the campaign for fiscal equity, something very heavy. Yeah. yeah. You've, how would you address the equity court rulings as governor? You're elected would, you, you, in, in office January 1st. What do you do about this? I would propose that, that, that more state funds in, over the, a stream of years... Uh, go towards high needs districts based upon open and transparent objective formula criteria like for instance the number of children who are uh, receiving reduced uh, or free lunch right. based upon the, right. the poverty index of the, of the parents. The, in, what in about New York City has a very high rate. That's right and, yeah. and so New York City and Mount Vernon and Buffalo and places like Yonkers and Hempstead would get a the lion's share of those additional resources. What are you talking about in terms of money? I, we know that the CFE has laid out certain values between right. four and four point five billion and, and five point nine and, billion. And, and what What's I, your attitude toward that as governor and well, as a candidate? My attitude towards that is that this is the problem when the courts get into what is in, intrinsically a political question, in terms of what the how you negotiate through a democratic mm -hmm. process by with elected officials a school aid formula. Now, there are a lot of problems, and the CFE plaintiffs are correct in terms of the problems with the non-transparency and the way the formula is politically rigged. But the question is, is this a better solution? Now, just to give you an example of what the consequences would be, if you took a $5.6 billion judgment, which the court said and the masters said you have to pay, you're the state, you have to, or, or state and city have mm -hmm. to come up with 5.6, if you extrapolated that throughout the whole state, Buffalo, Syracuse, Rochester, Yonkers, Mount Vernon, all these other districts, the number isn't 5.6 billion, it's about 9 to 10 billion. Now, the question is, well, where does that money come from? There is no treasure trove, treasure chest buried in the Capitol lawn with that money. It would have to come from about a 30% increase in the income tax, because today the income tax generates about $31 billion at the state level, 9 or 10 billion more 
is about 30% more in the income tax. But what about, you're the governor. You're sitting in, in that office and you've got this court decision. What do you do? I mean, you're saying raise, raise the, 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 the aid to New York City and other jurisdictions, would, but, but you're not, what are you doing with the decision? Are you going to appeal? What? Well, the decision, it's unclear now as to whether there's finality on that decision. And it's, it's not clear in my mm -hmm. mind as to whether th that is the final judgment or not. Courts' rulings need to be respected. On the other hand, the prerogatives of independently elected legislatures and governors have to be respected, too, under a, a, our three-branch system of government. The courts cannot order the legislature or the governor to either impose a tax or appropriate money. So the question still comes down to, if you have to come up with 5.6 or 8.6 or 9.6 billion in additional dollars, where does the money come now, from? Now, if the Court of Appeals rules that the lower court ruling holds, then they are telling you your constitutional interpretation is incorrect in terms of the branches. What do you do as governor? Let's cross that bridge when we come okay. to it. But, okay, it, let's, but, it, well, but it raises an interesting question as to how you would act as governor because right. you said that you felt that the courts had no place in, in a decision like this. But the, the public resorted to the courts because they got no response from the politically uh, way of doing things. Democracy, as Winston Churchill said, is the worst form of government ever devised except for all the others. And you still have this fundamental issue. And in fact, this was addressed in the three to two decision that the appellate division yeah. made. They said, here's what the range we think they should pay, but oh, by the way, we have no power to enforce this. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's the conundrum, if mm -hmm. you will. And so my, my approach would be to try to you know, bring the different t sides to the table, say, here's an approach that I think is financially feasible for the state. I would like to see accountability measures as well. And by the way, in education, I mean, I was the first proponent of charter schools. I think the mayor is on the right path in terms of accountability and choice for, for parents. And I think that it's very important that we create more alternatives and more choices for parents, particularly if the schools aren't performing as well. Can I, being a university professor, how do you assess the state system and the senior CUNY system, which is funded by the state. What, do you have specific plans how you can enhance higher education in New York State, or at least reform it if it's not being enhanced? Well, I, I, think, I think there have been remarkable changes that have occurred at CUNY in the last uh, seven, eight years. I mean, I think it has become, again, you know, people use, when I was growing up, people would always say how CUNY and places like Hunter and Baruch and places like that just had these marvelous educational institutions and the, the story is a legion of all the graduates of those institutions from the 40s and 50s who became famous in, in whatever their chosen profession was. But let's face it, it declined. It was really in a state of decline and I think the changes that have been made in the last few years uh, with Mayor Giuliani, with Governor Pataki, now with Mayor Bloomberg, I think those have been productive. What is uh, your higher, I mean, do you have a higher education agenda or analysis? I mean, what, what's the state of the SUNY system? Too many, too many facilities? I mean, well, there's a lot of a, issues there are, out there. Are there are a lot of facilities. I think you have to, you have to look at the, at the um, uh, curricula and the course offerings, make sure that they're compatible with the needs that are projected for jobs and, and the future. Also make sure that you've got extremely strong uh, liberal arts and science curricula. My son just graduated from a private college upstate as a philosophy major, and I was enthralled by that. <laughs> Not because I understood the papers he wrote, <laughs> right. uh, but because I felt that, that having a good liberal arts education is so vitally important to our common good and our collective wisdom as society. Well, I think it is, but if by raising the requirements for entry into the city universities, what's happening and how do we add extra programs for those who can't meet those requirements but still need to have the education and to, to move up? Well, I mean, I think you, you have to have, you have to make sure that you have uh, access and availability at the community college level right. as well. You also have, New York but has... The community colleges in New York are funded by the city. City, right. That's, Does the state have community colleges that they, they sure. fund? Sure. Well, yes. well, the county the, the they, are found, they are funded locally, but there's this, the... Are they part uh, of the state university they are, system? They are all part of the, of the, of the SUNY, SUNY system, system, ultimately, in the sense that they receive state funding. Uh, and it might be in, in the community college that's near me. I think they receive about 38 or 40% of their funding mm -hmm. from the state. 
And I believe the CUNY system receives comparable mm -hmm. state support mm -hmm. in terms of uh, uh, its needs. Mm -hmm. But I think the, the key is uh, on higher education is to make sure that you've aligned your uh, curricula and your, your courses of study in, in the different uh, schools with the job opportunities that are going right. to be out there for uh, young people in the future. Comment on the World Trade Center ground zero situation. You're elected governor. There's a hole in the ground, not much movement, lots of controversy. Well, I, I, what, what do you do? Well, I think you assess the situation at that time. You assess the deal that had, has now been entered into by, between the developer and the state and the Port Authority right. and the city. And uh, you try to you move it forward based upon the circumstance that you find. You're talking but, in general, specifically. You well, know you know the story the now. The, the the you can't predict what is going to be the situation in January. Right. Okay. Let's but say I you do, were elected I, now. I do think. Well, I think that they've now got a plan. Thankfully, finally. And I but I think it's a mistake for me as a candidate to sit here and and presumptuously tell you uh, so what should out. be done. Right. And I have some magic wand. I think it's really an insult to everyone who sat around a bargaining table because I wasn't at that bargaining table. And, uh, you know, in, with all due respect, uh, we, all of us weren't at that mm. bargaining. So we don't know all of the nuance and the give and take that existed. Is it too long? Sure. But is it, is it appropriate for me as a, as a candidate to say, oh, I would have done this or that? I think that's Monday morning quarterbacking of the worst sort. And it, uh, people don't like it if it's in the sports pages necessarily. And I don't think it's really fair here. Let's, let's Talk of mixture of politics and governance. I yeah. can tell by that. Yeah, you know, my, that, that's sort I'm of, gonna... you know, I, George Pataki's legacy of, as governor and how you would differ in terms of your well, approach to governance from George Pataki. You know, I, I, think, I think it's, you know, people always try to get you into, and I'm not saying you are, but I mean, reporters always try to get you into this trap being critical. I, I think, look, he's been governor uh, almost 12 years now. He, I think he performed very well working with the mayor after 9-11 when we had the arguably the biggest catastrophe in this terrorist attack that we have ever faced as a state and as a nation. Um, uh, secondly, uh, one of the things that he gets no credit for is a very significant agreement he brokered in 1997 with the New York City Watershed Agreement, the bringing fresh and pure water from 120, 130 miles north of here into the metropolitan area vitally important and that situation was careening into a endless litigation which would have cost the city and the state taxpayers enormous uh, amounts of money. I, can, can I just... Uh, yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. Quick, 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 quick. Implicit though when your question, in a, in a way it's a silly question because you're running and saying we have these needs and we haven't done this or we've done this incorrectly or something. So I mean I don't believe that you're totally pleased with the performance of the, of, of the governor and the state senate and the democratic uh, assembly you, you're not pleased with it for well, the, for many years because you do want to change it look and, after, and why and should if I am, you be responsible for the governor <laughs> you why shouldn't. shouldn't i be responsible you don't have to be re i don't no. i'm saying you don't have to answer this no, question I mean, <laughs> he asked <laughs> nice i asked the question and you tell me that's Ronnie, have to I'm, I'm glad you clarified that you know? <laughs> yeah, but you know what people like me would like to know is how do you feel about the national administration and uh, What's happening in the federal government? Do and we get enough aid in the state? Well, Do we get enough a, assistance? Here's Is it perfect, operating? Here's, here's a perfect example. And what about the war? Here's, here's <laughs> a perfect example um, in terms of Dan, pa Patrick Moynihan used to talk about the imbalance uh, between right. what New Yorkers pay and what we receive back from Washington. And um, the area where we get much more back is when the federal government cuts taxes because we are a very high tax, uh, high income wealth state. So for instance, the changes in the alternative minimum tax would be extraordinarily beneficial to people in New York State. We really need to take the people that are being really hit with this alternative minimum tax and raise that level much higher than it is now because now you've got, you know, a couple living on Staten Island uh, uh, she's a nurse and he's a fireman and they're making $110,000 a year and they're paying alternative minimum tax. It's really wrong. Um, so how uh, much money is that difference? What that mean? It would mean thousands of dollars difference to, uh, say, a couple earning $150,000. But, but, but what you're saying essentially is the appropriate federal policy toward New York yeah. is to give us more tax relief. Because, you know, every time he, our representatives in Washington go down there... But you're defending there, the tax cuts. 
Well, oh, absolutely. Yeah, right. I, right. I, I, I mean, abs that's right. Ab the yeah, dividend right. and capital gains yeah. cuts have right. been gr tremendous uh, spurs to state and city revenue, by the way. And they've also helped Wall Street, which is the biggest spur and but develop. That's the only, yeah, but so, that, right. those are the only people it's helped, really. No, no, it hasn't. Well, I mean, we get it, the revenue, you mean. It, it, it well, makes up for the budget cap in the city I mean, and stuff. But also, you know, uh, people that have 401ks, people that have uh, retirement plans, I mean, it, this is helpful to them. Uh, I think that the, one of the things that I think a lot of the people on the left mm -hmm. don't understand uh, is that outside of transportation, New York always loses on any of these things. So when I hear you know, one of our representatives say, let's have this new program for X, Y, Z, they are implicitly saying, New York, let's send a dollar down to Washington so we only get 80 cents back. I, I, I think that, that equation is not going to change. And by the way, that equation existed when you had a Democratic-controlled mm -hmm. Congress, not just mm -hmm. a Republican-controlled Congress. Mm -hmm. And because of our decline in population relative to the rest of the country, we're going to even lose more congressional seats after the next census. So where, where New York really does well in the, in the, uh, with the federal interchange is transportation. One third of all the people in the United States of America who ride mass transit on a daily basis ride the MTA. That's an astonishing it is. number. Right. And one of the big things that I want to do is I want to put more pay-as-you-go financing in for roads, bridges, and trans transit projects. Right. Yes, we need to improve the signaling, the communication, the switching. In you know, They're using 1920s technology installed by the Westinghouse people uh, to make sure trains aren't right. running on the same track. That, that can be so modernized, and it can save money, and you can lower labor costs, and you can lower del delays. So I'm a very big proponent of improved transportation. If you were governor, what would you do about immigration? And undocumented. I were, well, the, the governor can't do much about well, immigration. You do, we do what state you, things about. Well, very little, right. really. I mean, it's a national issue. I do think they have to have a more secure borders so that we can staunch the flow of illegals. But I think we also have to have a policy which says, let's welcome people who want to come here to work. Let's welcome people who want to come here and raise their families and, and earn a better living. That's how my uh, uh, forebears came here from Italy and Ireland about 100 years ago. And so I think we should be very respectful of that. But I also think we shouldn't just say, oh, uh, open up, uh, forgive anyone who's here. The law didn't matter because I think that means that the, the law is, is a nullity. And it also is disrespectful to the people who did stay online right. and who did follow the procedures. I also, though, uh, someone I can't remember who said this recently, I'd love to have anyone who's a scientist, a professional, make it easy, really easy for them to come into the country. Okay, we have to stop. I know you're having a good time. I know you, you don't, you're, you're a wonk. That's what you are. <laughs> it was a pleasure. Thank you.